So I'll kick off a series of papers on just this back to the basics. How do we do an operation and uh, uh, sort of renaming, rethinking, uh, can we do this traditional operation uh, better? So I've renamed the posterior approach the dorsal approach, or if you like, for the purposes of this panel, the superior approach. And uh, here are my disclosures. I am a consultant for Depew and on uh, several boards. So uh, I think bottom line is what do patients want that's, uh, that's being paid more and more attention to. And I think we understand that uh, many of them want to go home right away. Uh, not everybody does, but they don't want to stay in the hospital for a, a long period of time. And they want immediate mobility. They want to be able to get back to doing what they want to do. And in this case, it's, uh, in, in many cases, it's without limitation uh, as soon as possible. So my message is that there's more than one way to do that. And I think you'll hear uh, the descriptions about how to do this more than one way on the panel today. So the goal is that the ideal hip replacement should achieve the best functional result and a durable outcome. And we don't want to sacrifice one for the other. And what I want to show you today is that I think that handling of the soft tissue is key to the early recovery, no matter what approach you use. And I'm going to go back to revisit how I have changed my approach, this posterior slash dorsal slash superior over the years in the critical points. So I've got a series of uh, cadaver dissections, which uh, I'll share with you and uh, just to review some of the, the key anatomy. And first of all, it's the placement of the uh, skin incision. So you're standing behind the uh, patient here, the serpus topography is depicted in the dark, that's the trochanter. And where do you place the incision? Well, I'm thinking about placing that incision with the hip flexed in such a way that it will reflect the passage of the reamer when I'm doing the acetabulum. So it's right at about the anterior middle third of the, uh, the trochanter and it's uh, just uh, angled anterior to the uh, anterior cortex of the femur. So this, this lateral incision uh, may be biased a little bit anteriorly, avoids the panis, it avoids sensitive cutaneous nerves. It's an area that will heal readily. And I think it bears uh, noting, you can't stretch the skin, you can't pull the skin. This is a low energy, minimal retraction situation. And I think that's an advantage. So protect the skin next is, and I think key point uh, that the people doing the anterior approach have really emphasized is protect the muscle. So if you're doing this approach, you can protect the muscle. First is the realization that the, the transmuscular part, the interfiber part, is in a different angle than the skin incision. So there's the skin incision. If we peel this away and then look at the max and note the trajectory of the fibers, it's at a slightly different angle than the skin incision. So if you wanna go between the fibers and open the muscle without damaging or tearing or cutting, that passageway has to be slightly different angle than the angle of the skin incision. So bear that in mind and, and take the muscle, let it open, in the direction that it would, would naturally open. So again, reminding ourselves of the anatomy, the inferior gluteal nerve, the passage of these, this nerve from inferior to superior, the idea that if you stay more anterior, uh, you will be able to avoid this and then separate the muscle in line with the fibers rather than uh, tearing or cutting. And I think that makes a big uh, uh, difference in terms of how the patient feels. So, Thinking about the gluteal anatomy here, if I put the glute max back on top in this, in this diagram, think about the direction of the fibers. They basically run from front to back, and we're gonna bear that in mind when we create the passageway through. And then if we think about what's underneath the gluteus medius, there, the fibers of the gluteus medius are almost 90 degree perpendicular to the max. And I don't think that's depicted very well in anatomy books, but I think it's important, relevant uh, clinical anatomy for doing the approach. So that, that difference in direction and, and protecting the muscle with knowledge of that. Next is uh, protect and repair the capsule. I think this is a key point, and it used to be that I would take the capsule and the uh, piriformis and conjoint tendon in a single layer and repair it and think I was doing a good job. Well, really, in the past uh, maybe seven to 10 years, I've been doing it in two layers and really paying attention to the capsule, and I think that's made a big difference. So if we look again at the anatomy, I'm retracting the gluteus uh, medius forward here, and you see uh, it depicted in the highlight the uh, gluteus minimus and then the piriformis, 
And in between those is a little hiatus where you can make your capsular incision. So I'll peel the piriformis and the conjoint tendon off of the capsule, and then you'll be left with a very robust piece of capsule that you see depicted up there in the upper right that you can repair side to side. And it's very satisfying at the end of the case to do that. So identify the capsule, protect it, and repair it. And I think that's a key point. And this goes back to some uh, research we did early on looking at the biomechanics of the hip capsule ligament, knowledge of where the ischiofemoral ligament is, that's the major component of the posterior capsule, trying to preserve and repair that. And I think it does make a difference in terms of stability. Finally, a key point, and I picked this up from uh, David Beverlin in uh, Northern Ireland. He gave me this little instrument, which I'll show you. And that is just, you're, you're gonna measure before you cut and then restore in terms of length and offset. So I use this little caliper on every case to measure the length and the offset from the point at which I cut the neck so I know where I've started in terms of length and offset. And then when I put the prosthesis in, I know how I've changed it. So uh, measure before you cut. And the idea here is we're trying to restore the mechanics in the way we want to do it. I mentioned minimal retraction. This is kind of the workhorse, this instrument here. Uh, that goes when you're trying to expose the acetabulum, it comes underneath the neck over the anterior rim, allows me to pull the femur forward, and I elevate the anterior capsule. And you can see just kind of pressing that up and you get a really good look at the acetabulum with a small incision and minimal force. And then the, the, the subsequent steps, again, you see only two retractors in the wound. I'm protecting the implant from the skin. Just consider that skin contaminated the whole way through, even if you've prepped it and try to protect the prosthesis from it. But you've got a, a straight shot through a small incision and minimal pressure on the soft tissue. Uh, likewise, in preparing the femur, again, you can push it right up into the wound. Uh, the uh, gluteus medius is turned out of the way and very low energy uh, approach and good access. And then you see measuring the, the length and offset. And I've also measured the diameter of the femoral head. So I know where I've started, where I've finished, I have pretty good confidence in what I've done to the biomechanical restoration, even without an intraoperative image. And then again, to emphasize, repair that capsule at the end. Uh, I think that that is a very satisfying part of the case. And then nice uh, skin closure and you're done. So if you look at the literature on this, I think there's sort of an evolution. When the anterior approach first came out, there was a lot of criticism of it in terms of uh, potential complications, I think reflecting the learning curve. This. Uh, a uh, randomized study from uh, Mark Pagnano in the Mayo Clinic, they had a high, more bleeding with the anterior approach and uh, uh, no difference basically in, in clinical outcome. And now, and now I think as the literature has matured, experience has changed, there's really, uh, there's not that differentiation probably with some of the uh, larger uh, reviews and uh, meta-analyses reflecting the suggestion of an earlier uh, recovery with an anterior incision. Uh, my my uh, bias is that may be because of how the muscle is being handled with other approaches, and I don't think the evidence is strong. But I don't see a clear difference uh, reflected in the literature now if you do the operation carefully. So remind you uh, to close here of the innovator's dilemma and this idea of a hype cycle. We go through this uh, period of elation and excitement about something new, and then reality hits and you get a nadir, and then you come back out to a baseline as we really understand what's going on. And I think that's what's happening in approaches to total hip. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vail. Um, that was a terrific review. Always gratifying to know that you're doing more or less exactly what your chairman's doing, at least in the hip. <laughs> uh, and uh, now we're going to climb that slope of enlightenment uh, with Dr. Baer, he's going to talk to us a little bit about the right anterior and his love of his table. <laughs> so I don't think it's really fair to be on the panel, uh, for me to be on the panel with Dr. Vale and Dr. McDonald and Hanson, but I'll try to do the approach justice here. Um, so we're going to talk about on the fracture table anterior approach, and for my disclosure, I don't have any financial, but I trained on all of them, and so I'm choosing what I think was what I can do the best and what I can do best for patients. Um, I still do all of them in certain situations, except for off table anterior. Um, I kind of think of this, if you know the Marvel Universe, um, it's kind of like Captain America versus Iron Man, the posterior approach. They're all born in the 1920s, um, kind of very disciplined, tried and true. Uh, and then you have the flashier, maybe a uh, little more technology-based anterior approach surgeons. 
Um, this is what I'm going to kind of cover is kind of why is there's this controversy. Um, what, are, what do I think are DA truths versus myths and then on table myths and then go over my approach to it. Um, also like a true on table surgeon, I'm going to take a little longer than the off table surgeon. So I'm going to take some of Dr. Hansen's time, I think. Um, so this is uh, you know, it's not really a new approach. It's been around since the eighties when Hoyter described it, it's kind of come back in the last really 10 years has been the more widespread adoption. Um, and why is that? Um, the optimistic uh, way of thinking of it is that we're trying to improve patient care, faster recovery. Kind of the pessimistic op op uh, explanation would be we're looking to improve the bottom line and for marketing and industry pressure. Um, and there's a lot of these touted benefits of anterior approach that we've all seen and, and heard patients seeing on the internet um, that may or may not be true. Uh, and there's a lot of misleading claims uh, on the internet kind of muddying the water, even about the table. So, you know, this is from uh, a surgeon's website saying that the, the surgeon doesn't move the patient, we move the table. Um, and I don't know if that's, that's necessarily true. Um, so this is also from a major manufacturer's website um, looking at um, kind of posterior versus anterior approach. If you look at the posterior approach, according to this website, uh, Dr. Vail does a foot long incision versus my three inch incision. Um, he's also disturbing the joint um, and, uh, and the soft tissues, whereas I have reduced muscle damage. Um, and then I'm also letting my patients walk on the same day of surgery as opposed to him. Um, adoption without training is obviously gonna lead to complications. So you need to know what you're doing in anything. And so there is this idea that there's probably 50 cases that you need to do DA to know what you're doing um, or things like this can happen um, where you get an X-ray in the PACU that you, know, you kind of miss the femur there. Um, and so there's these false claims of superiority and that kind of adopters are seen as, as using. And then also there's the idea that maybe you're losing market share if you don't switch. So that leads to people getting upset. So what do I think are actually truths? You know, Dr. Vail and Dr. McDonald are going to go over a lot of this in the posterior approach. So I'll kind of just skim through this. Um, but, you know, it's familiar. Your learning curve is called residency. Um, and, and it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a great approach. I still use it. Um, for my DA approach though, the truths are it is internervous and it's intramuscular. It's a very nice anatomic approach. Um, and it kind of, when, especially when you're done with the case, it kind of just closes itself back together. It's, it's really nice from that standpoint. It's not traditionally extensile. So, um, I am primarily using this for primaries. It can be extended. Um, you can do certain, uh, takedowns of the TFL. You can swing it into a lateral, um, but I think once you start doing those sorts of things, obviously you are starting to lose some of the benefits of being intramuscular. Um, and so I'm not primarily using it for most revisions. It is done and I, I've done everything from a triflange and fellowship from the front to full femoral revisions. It's definitely possible, but it is much harder, I think. I think the biggest advantage of it is, is being, for me anyway, early in practice is being able to use fluoro and uh, that supine position makes fluoroscopy easy. Um, getting back to kind of the spine thing, I like to match my intraop imaging to what their functional standing view is and then place my cup uh, based on that. Um, you know, and, and then also this just helps me make sure that my implants are the right size, that they're in the positions that I want, that I'm restoring leg length and offset, and I know exactly where things are so that those PACU x-rays don't happen. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of studies looking at fluoro and does it make things better? None of them have ever shown that fluoro makes things worse. They've all been either the same or better um, with the exception of time. And so I, I think of fluoro as my navigation, it's my robot. I, I, I can put things exactly where I want and I know where it is. There's this idea that maybe you're getting exposed to more radiation as a result. You need over 300,000 hips to get a cataract from this. And this is from the older C-arms. The newer digital C-arms are pretty good. The dosage is only decreasing. So I, I don't consider this to be a major risk to myself. Um, and so I think early in practice, especially, you're very comfortable with how your x-ray is going to look in the recovery room, that you've restored everything exactly where you want. And, and you have good biomechanics as a result. Um, and this, I don't know how that happens from DA surgeons. That one in the bottom left was actually, one of my buddies sent that to me yesterday. Um, that was a DA approach done eight years ago and the patient's actually doing okay. The surgeon that did it told them that the stem was a little bit proud on the lateral side. Did it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're coming back for pain. <laughs> um, so this is, this is the most controversial part and, and it's, it's Rather than do the whole talk on this, I, I'd reference you. I actually wrote the, a review article with some of my mentors at Ortho Carolina looking at all the, the claims. And I do think that in the first six weeks, um, and again, this is not necessarily comparing me to Dr. Vale, but, but looking at 
all the kind of studies that are out there, um, I think there may be some benefit in the first six weeks. And so the, there's this idea of shorter length of stay. These are from randomized control trials as well. So shorter length of stay, maybe less pain medication use, quicker time off the walker. Um, and all these things kind of equalize at the six to 12 week point in the studies against posterior, the lateral did lag a few months behind there. And none of these studies importantly have ever shown an advantage for the posterior lateral over the anterior. Um, some showing advantage for anterior. And then if you look at PROs again, there's no difference in any of the patient reported outcomes at any time points. Um, but that may be a, a function of PRO uh, ability as opposed to if there is a difference. This is another DA truth of mine is that, you know, it's definitely a more finicky wound. Um, and so you have to be careful with the anterior skin. It's thinner. Um, there's no difference in the deep infection rate or the time, the uh, amount of time going back to the OR for wound complication, but definitely the clinic sphincter tone is a little higher with the DA approach as opposed to posteriors. And so in my experience, most of these are thankfully from fellowship, but um, no one, no difference in the take backs, but when they do fail, especially in obese patients, they can be pretty spectacular in the way that they fail. Um, and so for smaller things, there are, you know, you learn little tricks in, in terms of keeping it together. Uh, things like meta honey for, uh, at risk patients. I do sometimes use special dressings that have a little better tension, uh, support. Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing that I would say is a DA truth that it is techni uh, technically demanding, but there are ways to help yourself and especially with femoral exposure. So using offset handles, I use a single offset. There are double offsets that make it even easier. Um, using stems that are maybe, um, helpful in terms of shoulder relief. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Masonis, one of the, my mentors, used to say, why would you ever leave your best instrument in the hallway? And that was, that, that's the table. Um, so I'll go into that in a little bit. So what are some myths of the DA? I think the dislocation risk is one that is, is unfortunately a myth, uh, despite all the marketing and everything. I think the dislocation uh, difference is probably minimal to none with a modern posterior approach. Um, and the studies kind of support that. Even in the randomized control trials, there's been no difference in the dislocation risk between anterior and posterior. Uh, lateral does win consistently in the stability pretty much in every uh, uh, study that's looked at them though. And the registry data, there's, there's minimal out yet, but uh, this was uh, from the Michigan registry, no difference in dislocation rate, 0.8% with both, both groups. So that said, I, I do feel a little less worried about my anterior hips when I know that I've put everything where I want it. Um, and I, I do think the anterior position of instability is maybe a little bit less natural than a posterior position of instability. So sitting in a chair versus kind of doing the Zoolander spin out or doing a deep lunge, um, that's maybe not a position that people are going to get into as easily. Um, the next myth I would say is that the learning curve is unacceptable. Um, I, I disagree with that. I think the first 20 cases of anything that you do are going to be higher, a higher risk of complication. And this, this idea of the learning curve applies to people that have already been in practice. If you compare to expert DA to a second year resident learning the posterior approach, of course, there's going to be a difference in the complications. Um, and I think this will eventually disappear as it permeates through training programs. And they've looked at uh, surgeons coming out of training that have trained in both. Is there a difference between the two? And there's not. Um, we're probably bad at both of them equally, uh, as opposed to the more expert uh, surgeons. Uh, blood loss, this was touched on a little bit. Um, there is more blood loss in the first few cases. When you look at the meta-analyses looking at transfusion rates, however, um, there is no difference um, in transfusion rates. There's no difference in post-op hemoglobin changes um, once you get out of that learning curve. And the bleeders are always in the same spots. Just like the posterior approach, you know where they are and the, kind of the short external rotators and the anterior approach, you know where they are consistently. And if you know that, you can go after them. Things like TXA, regional hypoanest uh, ana hypotensive anot anesthesia and technique are obviously going to be important. And then OR time, I think the OR time is probably not a myth. Um, this is, it probably does add OR time. Um, and some of that is related to fluoro use. Um, and some of that may be just uh, in terms of with on the table anyway, some of the, just the positioning of the, of the table. But on average, in most of these reviews, it takes about eight minutes longer. When you look at the founders, the people who've been doing this the longest, the OR times are pretty consistent with what I would consider a good posterior or lateral approach time. The other myth um, being that DA causes less soft tissue damage. This came from a lot of these serum CK studies um, that are showing serum CK as a marker of muscle damage is higher in the posterior approach compared to anterior. But none of these studies have ever found an actual clinical value of CK that's important. So CK levels don't correlate with pain. They don't correlate with outcomes. They don't have any really established thresholds. So I kind of ignored these, these studies as, as helpful. And I think, um, you know, there was a cadaver study looking at off-table DA versus posterior. And the DA uh, uh, surgeons were 
this was an expert surgeon and DA, um, someone that, that people have trained with um, here, uh, that uh, you know, TFL damage was almost 30% of the TFL was getting beat up, um, and that they're releasing the conjoint tendons a lot of times, uh, even though that's kind of one of the, the harps in the DA that we're not releasing anything. So I think this is probably technician dependent, and there are ways to protect the soft tissues, just like Dr. Vale showed with the posterior approach, with the anterior approach, protecting the soft tissue is still important. Um, I use some of, the, some of these sleeves. I use the, this cheaper kind of plastic sleeve. I know Dr. Beanie uses it as well for his posterior approach. Uh, making sure your retractors have rounded edges. I like these self-retaining retractors because they don't fall out when the residents fall asleep on the other side. Um, they uh, also, using the hook on the table I think is helpful, so that's going to give you a better exposure as opposed to levering on the soft tissue off table. So this would be off table, you're kind of levering the femur, femur up as opposed to lifting it up with an with a elevator. Using appropriate releases, and then for me, I think getting that leg into full extension on the table is easier than breaking the bed or putting their hip on a bump. So off, on table myths, and I think this is forced controversy. I don't have any issue with the way off table people do. And it's kind of like looking at Ronaldo versus Messi. Who would you take in the Champions League? You're going to take either one. Um, but uh, this, there's minimal uh, uh, objective data to compare these. But I use some of the quotes that Dr. Hansen always says about on table stuff. So he would always say you're going to break an ankle with a table. Um, there were three ankle fractures that I could found in, find in the literature, and they're all in uh, Joel Mata's first 500 cases. Um, a lot of these posterior, or sorry, a lot of the off-table proponents always quote ankle fractures in the learning curve, and then they, I couldn't find any of the references because they were referencing spine articles, not um, hip articles. Um, there are spine fractures reported in the, on the table. Um, there's two in the literature. There's actually six from the lateral approach and more from the posterior approach as well in ankylosing spondylitis patients, so I don't think that's a big one. And then femur fractures in a direct comparison. This was the only direct comparison that I could find between the two. No difference in intra-op or post-op femur fractures between on and off table. There's also this idea that on table you can't truly check leg lengths and that if you were off table then you can you can me accurately measure your leg lengths and I would say that this is, I call this the physical therapist leg length check because you can kind of just swing the legs wherever you want it to make it look even. Um, and when they looked at off table, um, this was a study look, using EOS studies to act, EOS afterwards to actually measure what the true difference was. About a third of patients off table had a leg length discrepancy more than a centimeter, and afterwards a different, uh, mostly different, 21% had a leg length discrepancy over a centimeter. So I, I, I'll take this fluoro check. That's the area that I'm a, that I can affect and make even. I think that's the my most objective way of being accurate. Uh, my other on-table myth is who's going to run the table. Um, you know, you think that there's all these people in the room with a DA on-table surgeon. Um, in reality, if, uh, if anyone who knows this, this certain circulator, if he can run the table, anyone can run the table. <laughs> and, um, you know, the personnel is not much different. Um, you know, it's a surgeon, it's circular and a scrub. There is a fluoro tech that's different. But other than that, with a self-retaining retractor, this is me doing a case by myself because the residents weren't available. Um, you can do a hip by yourself with a scrub. Um, and also the resident can be on your same side. And the last time on table myth I would say is that you can't check stability. Um, I can check posterior stability, I can take it out of the boot, I can move it wherever I want. With the traction table I can lock in an external rotation and drop it all the way to the floor which is more than you can get on a table and you can trial until you know where it's gonna come out. Um, so I think that's important. And then also I'm not releasing anything in the back and in the capsule so there's no way for that hip to go. This guy came in to see me at the VA uh, two days ago or yesterday. Um, he's four weeks out and he was showing me how he could stretch and he was pulling his knee all the way to his chest, um, which would scare me from a posterior approach. Um, so my kind of approach to this is I'm using the DA on table for most of my primary hips. I like being uh, reproducible and knowing what things are gonna look like. I'm using it for my femoral necks and cementing those. For posterior, I use it for patients where I'm worried about wounds. So um, anyone with an overhanging panis, anyone who's very large. If it's a complex surgery, I'm not gonna struggle from the front. I'm gonna do where I'm more comfortable from the back and can be extensile and get a, get a big view of what I need to see. Um, and then lateral, I'm using only for revisions of prior lateral approaches. So um, we're all actually anterior surgeons, just in different joint. Um, some of us are moving towards it from to the hip. So thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much for a terrific discussion. I have to take issue with you on one thing, though. Ronaldo is clearly superior to Messi, and he's playing for the best team in the league right now. So I think you really should reconsider that idea. Um, very well, Dr. Hansen, what do you think? Uh, is the table 
optimal or should we rethink it and uh, consider doing the surgery without a table? <laughs> well, I want to thank Jeff for basically giving my whole presentation. Um, he's actually, he, we'll need about an hour for your next speaker. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, uh, he usually does the, the heavy lifting in our group, whether it's taking care of uh, complicated cases, helping me with the fellowship. Uh, but obviously, in regards to this talk, he's given a lot of the literature that supports why both of, uh, both of us use direct anterior for our primary total hips. So I'm not going to uh, go into that and in comparisons between the lateral and the posterior approach. So I, I'll use the analogy of the hungry bear and, uh, and the lost campers. And so I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you, Jeff. And, <laughs> So my, my, my focus is basically to explain why I use, uh, or I use a standard table to do my direct anterior total hips. And I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize this individual, Bill Hozak, uh, as being the teacher that I've learned everything regarding direct anterior hip surgery. Um, he's really been, been sort of a mentor in terms of being very uh, meticulous and methodical about doing the individual steps, but he's also uh, taught me a lot about how, how to become a teacher. And uh, for all the fellows uh, and residents that I've had the opportunity to train, you'll recognize that the heavy size and the uh, lighted helmets that, that have a disappointed shake uh, are me <laughs> channeling uh, Bill Hozak. So if anyone were to ask Bill Hozak, why don't you do your direct anteriors on this uh, fancy uh, table, uh, you know what his response would be. Why would you do that? And that's basically my approach as well. I don't think you need a specialized table uh, to achieve the outcomes that you're shooting for. And I think the meat of this presentation comes down to this paper, which was re recently published in uh, the JOA. And it reviews a thousand uh, primary total hips done by Bill Hozak, the way that he taught us, uh, which was using a standard um, proximally coded stem, not a mini stem, on a primary uh, standard operating table and without uh, fluoroscopy with a minimum of two year follow up. He showed that he had no intraoperative fractures, uh, no perforations, had great um, radiographic uh, outcomes, including neutral stem alignment, and nearly 100% and appropriate cut positioning and greater than 95%. He was also able to achieve uh, correction of limb length uh, discrepancies to within two millimeters and had a very low rate of uh, dislocation and revision surgeries. And while I don't put myself in the league of Dr. Hozak, using his steps, I think I have also been able to achieve Good outcomes, uh, albeit I use a fluoro uh, scanner the same way that D uh, Jeff does, and I, seven years into practice, uh, haven't uh, shied from that because I think it does give me valuable uh, feedback. Uh, and it's interesting to note that he did a thousand cases uh, in two and a half years. It's taken me my whole practice to get to that level, so I think I still have a ways to go. So the remainder of the talk will focus on my technical tips for doing the anterior approach on a regular table and then review some of the benefits and limitations of the on versus off table. So first off, it's important to uh, position your bed uh, appropriately. I reverse it so that I can have the, um, is there a laser printer? I reverse it so I can, I can bring the fluoro scanner in uh, easily and I have gotten to a point where I'm pretty efficient with use of fluoroscopy. I get my last uh, hemispheric trial, my final cut position, final uh, brooch, uh, and then final construct. So a very, very efficient use of the fluoroscopy. Um, but this helps uh, in terms of making sure that it doesn't impinge against the bed. Also, most of us who use the um, standard table will put a contralateral uh, arm board just uh, adjacent to the leg, and this allows us to abduct the non-operative leg and adduct the operative leg uh, for femoral preparation. I've also found that it's important to be mindful of how your cushions are set up. Um, part of the approach relies on uh, hip hyperextension. If you unfortunately have your cushions set up so that they break right where the, the, the bump is or where the hip is, you won't be able to achieve as much uh, extension of the hip. Some surgeons will break the table so that the leg will be um, lowered and this will allow hyperextension. I've tended to use the bump uh, the, under the sacrum, which achieves the same purpose and have, haven't found the need to have to additionally break the bed. So here's the sacral bump uh, placed underneath the uh, pelvis of this individual. I was taught classically to, to center it uh, under the ASIS. Uh, in, my in my early experience, I had a couple of cases where manipulation of the leg, pulling traction for the reduction in dislocation, 
uh, of the hip actually uh, caused the patient to fall off the bump, which worked against me and made femoral preparation uh, very difficult. So now I cheated uh, approximately two thirds distal, one third uh, proximal to the uh, ASIS. I also use uh, a sheet uh, to tuck under so that I make sure that the bump doesn't migrate uh, during the procedure. And I've also found that using um, a Velcro belt rather than the standard metal clasp belt is helpful to avoid obstruction of the brooches as they, they come in and out of the wound <clears throat> uh, during the femoral preparation. I, like Jeff, am, am moving to self-retaining uh, retractors with the associated posts. Uh, the idea is that you put these posts here and then you can put these zip line retractors, which I'll show. Um, on the ipsilateral side, you're gonna put them at the level of the knee uh, and the nipple. Um, and you just have to be uh, mindful of where your arm table is and, and your belt so that you have enough room to place one of these uh, um, self-retaining uh, posts. On the contralateral side, we have the long ones, and you uh, have to be mindful that you're not going to put the perineal nerve on compression as you abduct the, the non-operative leg. So there's some variability in, in where you'll put that um, uh, around the, the knee. Here I've placed the self-retaining retractors in anticipation of my first retractor setup. So uh, there's one that utilizes the distal post and then one that utilizes the contralateral post. And this is the setup that I have uh, before getting started. This is the, the, the retractors that I have in place for my femoral um, exposure or my, my capsular exposure, my neck osteotomy. You can see that uh, on the contralateral side, I've, I've got this one just uh, over the acetabular rim and one uh, distal underneath the uh, inferior neck. Um, Obviously, uh, this, this uh, assistant is, is just here for the picture. Uh, we don't need uh, an extra set of hands. And I think if I opt, uh, opted to uh, get a couple more of these retractors, then I could do this approach like Jeff by himself. When uh, we've made the neck osteotomy and then we're going to the acetabular exposure, this retractor, the superior one, is removed. And then this lateral one is placed posterior on the acetabulum in the five o'clock position. Uh, of a left hip, and this allows the femur to be translated posteriorly. And then when we're going to prepare the femur, uh, we have to adduct uh, and externally rotate the uh, femur. Again, this is the left hip. Um, and we can place two self-retaining retractors, so we don't need any um, uh, assistance with that uh, in, in select patients where we place one on the calcar, one over the trochander, and then we have a nice view to be able to, to broach for our femoral component. So what are the benefits, in my opinion, of doing it off table? Well, well obviously there's no need for a specialized fracture table, and uh, none would argue that there is an initial cost of, of purchasing one of these things. I think there is a bit of a setup time, though probably not that significant in terms of getting the patient uh, on the table. But I think more importantly is the logistics of having this be part of your practice. So if you're running two rooms or you're doing total hips with a, another surgeon who uses the table, you either have to coordinate your schedule so that you're uh, both allowed to, to use the table um, and, or else you have to purchase more tables. And then this idea that uh, you've got to rely on somebody to help you position the leg in, sp in space. And uh, Jeff uh, had a nice picture of one of our, our circulators, but I, I personally have trouble with some of them finding the right sutures for me. So trusting them to be able to position the leg in space is a little bit more, uh, it's a little more difficult for me to feel comfortable with. I actually think that the, the main reason that I do it off table and continue to do it off table is the following two points. Number one, I'm able to clinically assess the leg lengths. And I use uh, obviously a number of different criteria to assess leg lengths. I use fluoroscopy, so I use radiographic parameters to ensure that I've reproduced my preoperative template. But I think not only is the, the assessment of the medial, ma medial malleoli one option, but I think actually there's something very um, important about the tactile feedback that is um, obtained when you, you reduce a hip. And you can tell whether you're putting the hip under too much tension or not. And so you get a general sense over um, years of experience of how much of a clunk is the just right amount of clunk for that patient's uh, soft tissues. And then in terms of uh, uh, testing hip stability, it's much easier to do it off table. I, I know Jeff showed that you can actually test posterior stability uh, off table, but I didn't 
actually realize that you did that, but in, in general, um, we worry about anterior instability, which is achieved either on or off table. But in my early experience, I actually had a couple of people who were unstable posteriorly, which probably due to uh, some aggressive uh, 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 femoral uh, elevation and exposure that left them with a, a deficient posterior capsule. And so, in those patients, I had to make them posterior hip precautions for six weeks. And fortunately, were not uh, was not uh, uh, resulting in a, a posterior hip dislocation. But I think it is very important to to do both of those things, and it's easier for me um, off the table. And then we talked a little bit about iatrogenic fractures. Obviously, no approach is immune to intraoperative fractures. Uh, and the DA approach is probably notorious for having the highest rate, especially during, during the learning curve. These can happen around the proximal femur. We talked about uh, sort of idiosyncratic ones for the um, uh, table, including the, the femoral shaft, the ankle, and then as uh, Jeff mentioned, there have been case reports of actually fracturing the spine um, with the table published out of the Mayo Group. So I don't, definitely don't want to be the surgeon that's trying to put in this hip, end up with this fracture, and then a 360 degree fusion from, from one of my spine partners. And although this is a case report, I think we are seeing a greater number of people with spine pathology, fusions, et cetera. And there may be a, additional tension put on that with hyperextension and the leg not supported uh, by a table, uh, by a standardized table. So the limitations of off table, uh, Jeff can do uh, total hip replacement by himself. They always say that we need an additional set of hands. What some people call an additional set of hands, I, I consider education and the development of the next generation of arthroplasty surgeons. And I'm actually pretty confident that if I wanted to do it without any uh, residents, I would just need uh, a few more self-retaining retractors and potentially using uh, a drape that allows me to drape out both legs so that I can position the operative leg underneath the um, non-operative leg in a fixed adducted externally rotated position. So in terms of the comparative literature, as Jeff mentioned, there really isn't a lot. Although I believe that it improves my ability to um, uh, achieve leg length restoration and stability, there's actually no uh, papers that compare on and off table. And as Jeff mentioned, regarding fractures, this is the only one that I found in the literature that, that compares them head to head, which was two surgeons outside of their learning curve, 500 total patients with uh, intraoperative femoral fracture rate of 2.5%, which is equivalent between the two. Uh, and in their discussion, they review some of the case reports of either fracture table or standard table, and the, the rates are somewhere between 1 and 7%. So why I haven't switched to the table? Well, I think as arthroplasty surgeons, we're, we're creatures of nature. We do what works for us. I've mentioned some of the logistic hurdles uh, in terms of trying to uh, get a table or to uh, embark on another learning curve, doing a surgery uh, with a new uh, technology. Um, I think the assessment of leg length and uh, stability testing is important. I think there's something that can't be reproduced with that tactile uh, sensation. And I think probably most importantly, I'd be afraid of, of facing Dr. Hozak at the next Rothman dinner and telling him I'm using the table. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much for that description and very detailed um, review of the surgical technique, which is really helpful. Next from Canada, Dr. McDonald, teaching us about the anterolateral approach and why the limp is a myth. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I've come every year and uh, it just gets greater and greater. This meeting is fantastic. So thank you. We enjoyed ourselves yesterday. We uh, tried to make a dent in the wine in the region, but I don't think we did much. So uh, a show of hands. So the surgeons, how many here their go-to is a posterior approach? And uh, direct anterior, this, this part's gonna be painful, and direct lateral? <laughs> Do you want me to give the talk still? Or <laughs> Yeah, so um, I will give a, a few pointers on the, on the approach itself. So, that, oh, to go back, those are my disclosures. Uh, institutionally, receive support from uh, several companies. I'm a consultant, receive royalties for IP development from Depew, and a stockholder in uh, several startups. So, the title is it uh, is the limp a myth was actually given to me by the uh, the course organizers, but I'm happy to go through it. So, I really believe the premise that there's no one ideal approach for total hip. I think is true in the sense that I look at it and teach the residents and fellows is what bothers you the most is kind of going to be what you gravitate away from or trying to avoid. And, and I think that's a fair way to look at it because 
The approaches are not the same in terms of the risk for dislocation, the risk for early abductor weakness, and femoral component issues. They're not the same. And if dislocation is the thing that you're, you fear the most, then you gravitate away from the posterior approach. It's just that simple. If you really don't want to have any degree of early muscle weakness, then don't do a direct lateral approach, obviously, because you're going to have it. And if femoral component issues are the thing you really fear, then most series show the direct anterior approach still has slightly higher problems with the femoral component. So if you look specifically at the epidemiology of dislocation around the world, and this data is from Medicare data, it's an updated database, and it really is the U.S. current experience is about 2% of hips within six months dislocate. Now, everybody can get up and say their series, not in their series, not in their series, but if you look at a broad database of tens of thousands of cases, that's current data, and this is with the advent of 36 heads. So this is kind of where the U.S. is living right now, about 2%. Our data out of our institution for direct lateral is about a tenth of that. It's about 0.2 to 0.3%. And these were all with 28 heads. We do 36 heads now. And I gotta tell you, it's really, it would be shocking if I get a text from a, a resident saying one of your primaries is dislocated. Not revisions, not you know d uh, dysplastic cases, but a standard case. It's not zero, but it's approach is close to it, quite frankly. So it's not a new approach. So it was first described over 40 years ago. So it's kind of not new. Not sexy, kind of like the guy giving the talk. It's kind of been around a while, and that's just the deal. It's an abductor splitting approach, as you all know. So you do actually split the abductors. It takes advantage of the continuity between medius and vastus lateralis distally. And then the way, the way we do it now is minimus and capsulus split as one layer. We no longer do a capsulectomy, much as in the posterior approach has gravitated towards that. So this is how it was originally described. You can see that the original split was this quite a large posterior split. Anterior is, is to the top. So the, the majority of the abductors were taken off. And if you're, if you're doing it this way still, the medical term for you is there. I mean, you don't do that anymore. And if you do it that way, you're not going to have very good results. You want to do an anterior one-third split. Back two-thirds of the abductors are kept, not damaged, and, and that's the right way to do it. Also, I leave a good cuff just anterior to the troch so that when you repair it, you want to see the muscles come back into plane. That's when you know you've done the repair properly, not that the muscles are still left sort of sagging behind. It. So why do it? Well, you, it's definitely got excellent exposure on both socket and femur side. It's extensile, so I do it for all revisions, including a cup cage, for example. So there's not really limited. You can do a T, uh, extended trochanteric osteotomy also through this. I think it does facilitate component orientation. I also do train residents and fellows, and we don't use floor for this approach. So I like to see 360 on the shell to teach them how to place the shell properly. Exceedingly low dislocation rate, but it's interesting, it's decreasing in its use. You saw two, three, two, three of us, that's it, left in the audience. And in the U.S., it's never been as high as it was globally. You've always been a posterior approach country. Where you go around the world, direct lateral has always been more commonly used. Why hasn't it caught on? Because of this, the disadvantage of actually abductor weakness going through the abductors. Now, it's exceedingly rare for it to be a long-term complication, but not zero. But again, you've got to respect the anatomy and do a proper repair, just like Tad was talking about the posterior approach, to maximize the benefit. So in London, we've been doing this approach since 1988. We've done 30,000 hips, not a single patient ever with even the slightest limp. Ever. <laughs> okay. Maybe one or two of my partners. But so yeah. I want to just take you through some of our thoughts on it. So let's look at the evidence. So you all know that when you look at levels of evidence, one is a randomized trial. Five is an opinion, and you think, well, what are some level five examples that are out there? You know, and there are level five examples if you look for them long and hard, and you will eventually find an opinion piece. And so let's look at actually the data. So what does the evidence show? Let's start with the complications. So this is an excellent paper that came out a couple of months ago, and this is looking at basically uh, the Rothman Clinic's experience over a number of years. So 16,000 total hips all of which were followed for two years, and they've done all the approaches, posterior, direct anterior, direct lateral. So let's look at instability. So what's the instability rate in their series, high volume surgeons? Posterior approach, 1.7%, the direct laterals, 10 times less at 0.17, and direct anterior was in between. So that's, that's their series, and most authors would replicate that in large series. It's just the way it is. It hasn't, it hasn't gone much under 2% in, in really any center. 
So let's look at femoral component failures. And they classify those as fractures in combination with loosening. And again, direct anterior is two to three times higher with posterior and direct lateral being about the same. So femoral component is about the same for those, but definitely higher femoral component complication if you do a direct anterior approach. Their conclusion was the direct lateral approach confers the lowest overall risk of complication. And, I don't, and we can debate that, but I actually think that's true. So you say, okay, I can see that I'm going to have slightly higher complications with the other two approaches. Meta-analysis and systematic review. Publication last year looked at every randomized clinical trial published to date in the orthopedic literature, looked at outcomes and complications, balancing pros and cons. They recommend using the direct lateral approach for total hip. But a show of hands, hardly anybody's doing it. Why? Because the problem isn't so much just the complication as you're looking at function and the limp. And is that right? Is this, do these cases have these catastrophic limps that we're all missing? So the weakest literature out there is retrospective review. Here's the first series. A retrospective review of a, a small number of hips, but at two years, posterior versus lateral, lateral versus, in this case, is Watson-Jones. No between goop differences in limp rates. That's a retrospective review. In the past couple of years, there's been four different randomized clinical trials trying to look at this topic. Number one, this is posterior versus direct lateral ran, uh, randomized clinical trial. And they looked at every sort of outcome measure most of which Barrett and I have never even heard of in our life. Three-dimensional gait analysis, including gait deviation index. Barrett had one of those last night. Temporospatial parameters, our range of motion, isometric maximal hip muscle strength. Tad, do you know half of these things? I don't do you, Stefano? Do you do this on all your patients? They measured them at three months and 12 months. Again, no difference between these two groups, posterior versus direct lateral, when they're specifically trying to look at muscle function. Now, this... And then there's a series of randomized trials of direct lateral versus direct anterior. This is out of my center, the group of the younger surgeons. They looked at all these outcomes at two, six, and 12 weeks. So they're trying to focus now on the early few weeks after. And this is where you're going to start to see a bit of a difference. So they measured a lot of other parameters as well, gait velocity and stride length, multiple patient-reported outcome measures. There's never a difference in how the patient perceives their hips depending on what approach. No one's ever shown that. What they, what they were able to show is that two weeks and six weeks, gait velocity and single limb support were better in the DA group. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you've, even if you've just gone a third of the abductors, at two weeks and six weeks, they're still, that, they've still taken a bit of a bang. But even by 12 weeks, they couldn't show a difference again in a randomized trial. Another randomized trial, multiple outcomes, no difference in hip function. Another randomized trial, DA versus direct lateral multiple outcomes, pre-op 3, 6, 12, 24 months, no difference in outcomes, no case for superiority in, in of a direct anterior over direct lateral, but they did mention, they didn't measure it as much, but just mentioned there were a few more Trendelenburg positive DAs, which kind of makes sense, I guess. So I'll go back to where I started. I don't think there's one ideal approach for a total lip. No one's going to change their approach today based on a lecture, but again, I've sort of looked at the philosophy as what bothers me the most, avoid that approach, and for me, I've landed on the fact that I will concede and I'll tell my patients, you're going, to be a, you're going to have a bit more of a limp in those first two to four to six weeks than you would if you had another approach. But your overall complication rate, I believe, will be less. Direct lateral approach, straightforward, reproducible, extremely stable. And I, in my hands, and I do believe late persistent abductor weakness is exceedingly rare. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. So I have a series of questions, but I invite anybody in the audience from to to join us uh, and ask that whatever questions you wish. Has anybody changed their mind about their approach based on the lectures today? We, um, yeah, it's actually quite an interesting question because we are kind of stuck in our ways. I I did all of them um, and had to learn the anterior of the table from Eric when I came to UC because we didn't have a table originally, so I've tried them all, and what. Reason I haven't really gone over ones up being that skin issue. We've seen too many breakdowns and just don't need that posteriorly. And that does bother patients. The scars not pretty. So you want to talk a little bit about any pearls about anterior skin closure? Either one of you guys. A couple, a couple of things I've learned over the years. Um, so one of the things is is the deep closure. And I think um, when we close the TFL fascia, you can use whatever suture you like, absorbable, non-absorbable. Uh, 
quill, uh, some type of barb suture. But what I have had an issue with is then thinking that I'm going to close the fat down uh, with that same running barb suture. And I think Derek and I have had the same experiences where we try to close the dead space thinking that we're going to prevent a seroma. But what we end up having is we have this almost like jiggly saw on the fat as the patient uh, begins to mobilize and, and the, the, it creates sort of a deep dehiscence of fat. And that, uh, that so I don't uh, do that anymore. I do some simple interrupteds in the, in sort of the, the, the fat and the, and the deep dermis. And then the, the other thing is regarding the skin itself. I think we've all kind of moved to a subcuticular stitch, but there are definitely those individuals where the proximal aspect of the incision is a little bit beat up, um, during my broaching, uh, technique. And so if I ever am worried about that area, which tends to correlate with the panis, then I'll throw some, uh, simple interrupteds, uh, external, and, uh, and, and I've been okay with that. And the last thing is just the, the use of meta honey. So I think all, all DA surgeons have had, uh, that case where you see the yellow slough, uh, at the three week, four week mark. Um, and I've been very happy with the results of using this, this medical grade honey on it. It tends to, 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 um, I guess, uh, chemolyse the, uh, the necrotic tissue and allow the skin to heal by secondary intention. The question of meta honey is interesting. You, honey doesn't go bad under any circumstance. It has a tremendous antibacterial properties that are not qu completely understood. And when applied to wounds that are not doing well, it has a very um, beneficial uh, effect to the healing. We are losing the bees. But we're losing the bees, getting more expensive. Yeah. Jeff, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I mentioned some of it in the talk. It's just kind of handling the skin throughout the case so it is in good shape when you are closing it, I think is really important. Um, and uh, the way I close, I do use a barb suture in the, the deep dermis um, to close it down in a monocrole, but I also use steri strips over the top of my glue, kind of trying to help prevent some of that tension. Um, and again, if I am worried about it in a really obese patient or if I'm in a, a crease, um, I will sometimes use the um, uh, like a meshed dermabond type dressing. Um, and I'm avoiding the obese patients um, with my DA approach. So I'm not doing it in smokers. I'm not doing it in people that are on steroids or have you know wound healing risk factors. So in those patients, I do do a different approach. Dr. Blumenfeld. So you know we've, we've talked about the direct anterior approach. And I, I think it's fair to say that it almost was started like the mini incision. All these massively good things were occurring because we made a small incision. And then science debunked that. And I think most of us went from what we were trained in to some incisional length that you can do the work from and make sense. Okay. What I keep on hearing for about the direct anterior approach is, I know I have these problems, but they go away over time. And yet, and I'm blanking on the guy who reported his data out to 800 cases where they actually don't go away. The only study I know of that showed any beneficence is Taunton's in core in 2014, said you get off walking devices sooner. So the question is, why do an approach that in my opinion, I hear most of the guys who do it apologizing for it. Yeah, I know I, I got a slightly higher fracture rate, but you know, uh, the patients like it. Why persist when it's been around long enough? And as Steve pointed out, there's no difference in dislocation rate. You got a higher fracture rate. What's the reason to persist? So, you know, I, would, I, would, I would say that the data for that, I, I, I don't think that, that there is good data to support that necessarily. There's data, so, so people always quote, there's a paper that was actually on the North Carolina group looking at, North Carolina and Mayo looking at revision, or reasons for revision, I think. Um, and they, they quote that the reason for revision for posterior was higher percentage of instability. The reason for posterior anterior is more femoral complications, but that's, there's no denominator to that statement. So you don't know how many DAs came back with this number of femoral complications, how many posteriors came back with this number of instability. So I don't think that that's ever really been shown that there's a higher fracture rate from anterior. Um, so I, I don't, I kind of disagree with the comment. Um, and I, I think like Dr. McDonald said, you, you see which, what's the highest risk for this patient and kind of choose an approach based on that. The other, the other point I would make, just kind of looking ahead, what do we need to do better? Steve and I were joking a little bit about technology and all these crazy things that are being measured. But the reality is we have 
now the ability to more easily measure gait in the real world or patient walking down a hall without sending them to a gait lab and beginning to understand, are there these, these little differences that patients are telling us about in the first two, four, six, 12 weeks maybe, are they real? Can we measure them? We have sensitive enough tools and, and maybe uh, we're, we're beginning to have develop those tools through technology, through video capture that'll help us get there. I, I agree with that. I mean, but the you got to always be careful to not, because this kind of goes back to when we used to debate unis and total knees, and the unis guys were always saying, well, they're better, better, we just haven't got the right tool to measure it kind of thing, and like, okay, but how sensitive a tool, like, do we get to? It's orthopedics. We went into it because we like using ham hammers, right? Um, but the, I think the fracture rate, the, well, the Rothman group that I presented there, it was pretty clear when they looked at their 16,000 cases, and DA versus direct lateral versus posterior, that the DA were at 1.2% and the others were at like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So whether that's a big difference in your hands, that's high volume guys doing it after a number of years. Uh, so I, I think it is slightly higher, which even talking to even my ju two junior guys who do it, they sort of can see that it's the femur side of anything that they're most fussed about, not so much the socket. Would you same when you, for yourself even after doing a thousand? Yeah, so whether it does resolve over time, I don't know. But Tom, it's a good point, Tom. I mean, at the end of the day, for the guys who do DA, are you doing it mainly because you think functionally it's much easier for them to get over for that first couple of months? Is that the pre premise, really, what we're down to? Because there's no long-term going to be difference. Well, I, I think that's one part of it. But I, I think the other part is kind of what I was talking about, that I think I'm more reproducible from the front. I think I can get restoration of the anatomy more uh uh, consistently from the front using uh, fluoro and you being in a position that's that's comfortable and I, I think also it, it makes sense to me to not be going through a muscle I think that the anatomic dissection is, is good and I think if you're using these tools to make the femoral exposure easier which I feel like the way that I was trained to do it has done that for me that that I think that those risks are not necessarily there so in looking at sort of these randomized control trials looking at experts at both um, they're not seeing these differences and complications that are necessarily reported in these non-randomized studies. So a lot of these non-randomized studies, there's obviously patient selection bias in all the groups. And, you know, if you're seeing more fractures in, in, in the younger, bigger men versus, you know, the obese, older ladies, there might be, that, that might be the reason. But again, I, I think that I use the approach that I think is going to be best for that patient in my hands. And I think that all of us do that. We, we use what we think we're best at and going to do the best for the patient. It's too bad. So we... well, that's good. It's too bad. There's been just so much hype around it. Yeah. Because it puts a bad taste in everybody's mouth, right? And you, you, you're trying to sell, upsell an approach and you don't really need to, but that's what's happened. And we're touching on this idea of uh, sort of personalized medicine, using the right approach for the right pain. But in reality, we're not. You know, I'm using my okay. approach on everybody okay. and making it work. And uh, so we're doing what, what works for us as opposed to maybe that is the best personalized approach, but uh, we're not necessarily following that line of thought. Um, I just want to, Dr. Hogan, one second. I'm just going yeah. to follow up on a question here. Um, you, you, you claim that you have a better sense of where you put in your components than we do doing posterior because of the x ray. However, I can show you some films of anterior hips that I did where the fluoroscopic image was just beautiful. And then I stood the patient up and took an x-ray standing. Now the pelvic tilt comes into play and suddenly that picture doesn't look quite so good anymore. Yeah. So are you fooling yourself into thinking you've achieved the right positioning with, uh, in a dynamic environment as opposed to a static supine environment? So I'm, I'm actually the only one in our group that takes standing films pre-op for that exact reason that I can match it in surgery with fluoro so that I know where I'm putting it in a dynamic position when they're standing. So um, I, I am trying to do that. And I don't know that that's better. That's never been shown to be better versus placing it in an anatomic AP. But um, that's just to me, I put it in 15 to 20 degrees of antiversion based on what their functional standing pelvis looks like. And I match that with the fluoro. So again, again this is, uh, we're not gonna change So to be anything. clear, you're going to get your picture standing and then in the operating room you're going to move your c arm until you match that amount right. of tilt on the x-ray right. so that your imaging just so everybody's clear yes. so usually it's about 10 degrees of outlet tilt to match it thank you just one comment on the femoral side of things from the anterior approach i wonder if there is maybe some internal bias in some of these studies because a lot of pressure was put on surgeons to go anterior potentially by industry and patients and the femoral components change dramatically and we all I think would agree that the short 
metaphyseal only engaging stems have a higher risk of both loosening and potentially fracture. So I wonder if that's a bias in some of these larger studies. It'd be very interesting to see, are they using more traditional stems, even just a regular medial lateral tapered stem, right? Um, versus like a dual tapered stem is very difficult to put in from the front on, on a routine basis. But we know that the short stems and these all of these cute things that make it easier to do it from the front come along with higher failure rates. Any thoughts on that, Eric? No, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good point. Um, as I mentioned, I uh, continue to use the stem that I was trained on, which is a proximally coated single wedge taper stem from the front. Um, I, I know that you can put in uh, dual wedge taper stems, ream and broach. You can do a whole bunch of different things from the front, but I think that this represents kind of the nice balance between not going too small and not doing a stem that it is unnecessary from the front as well. Here's those, uh, those Ross, the comparative studies were all with the same stem, right? They're all, they're yeah, not, they're, they're, all, they're all the same stem. If we keep both microphones on, uh, let's just do a quick run down the line here, talking about the perioperative uh, recovery uh, and see what variation they mean between um, anterior and posterior. I'll speak as a posterior surgeon primarily. So let's talk about uh, posterior precautions or any kind of precautions. Um, I still do a little bit of posterior precautions. Eric, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have to give precautions to anybody? Uh, for an anterior hip, there's a, a very rare patient where I will have them uh, have anterior uh, precautions. That That's usually a fairly lax female. Um, and rather than trying to increase soft tissue tension to make me feel better in the surgery, I'd rather over lengthen her uh, and, and keep her equal and then allow her soft tissues to heal over a period of about six weeks. And okay. Interlateral approach precautions? Uh, no, no hip precautions, weight bearing is tolerated. The only thing we do is no active abduction for six weeks, just to let those heal. Let, uh, let talking of which, before you leave that concept, what do you do for your closure? Anything, any, any tips about how to reattach that tendon to the bones so that doesn't? Yeah, off? it's a, I almost have to, I should show a video. Your videos were good. As I watched yours, I thought I should do a cadaver one on direct lateral because it, you can, it's just much better. You can get the camera angles. It's a good way to do it. But the key, the, honestly, the key is when you do your split at the level of the femur, people have tended to take the split too posteriorly into the GT bone and not leave a little bit of a soft tissue cuff. So there's one of two ways. You can either do it through bone, which is okay, but I find it more fiddly, or you just leave about a centimeter of cuff off of the femur. And the key is when you bring that sleeve back up, the muscle, you will see it if you've done it properly, the muscle elevates back to the same plane as what's left in the abductors. People sew it poorly and it stays down inferior, you haven't repaired it properly. So the repair is critical. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, I'll just say reflecting on uh, this, somebody mentioned the mini incision and, uh, you know, the, now that all the conversation about approach, what strikes me is over time, what's pushed us along in whether it's precautions or how we do this is the patients. If we do a little bit better, the patients will want a little bit more. So I showed you that those pictures of uh, patients and one of the slides, they're all patients of mine. Somebody's kickboxing, somebody's skiing, somebody's water skiing. That's what they do, uh, regardless of what we tell them. And so we're trying, we've, we've been trying to keep up over the years. And I think we're doing a better job of allowing patients to do basically whatever they want. So the, what, the only thing I tell my patients now is I don't want you to bring your knee to your opposite shoulder. <laughs> Just don't do that. And, uh, and, I'll, I'll be okay, and you'll be okay. Um, just one comment about PROs. Um, a lot of the studies anchor the results based on PROs. And one of the work, some of the work we just got back from the lab now, in the, we, we got gate lab data, we got sensor data, and then we got patient report and outcome data on a set of patients all done at the same time. Then we got something like 10 million data points for these folks. And we use machine learning and, and really cool algorithms to try to find correlations. And what's fascinating to me is that the patient report outcome measure doesn't correlate with the sensors. That's fine. People kind of okay with that. But the stuff that we consider to be ground truth, that is the 40 meter walk test, the get up and go test, those functional studies also don't correlate with PROMS. In fact, none of those three measures correlate with each other in any which way possible, again, using really fancy modern algorithms. And it's like, what are we measuring with PROMS actually? 
if it don't seem to correlate, you know, we talked about maybe it's the wrong measure. And in the past, we've said there's a ceiling effect. You know, a problem won't tell you someone's playing 18 holes of golf without a cart and someone that needs a cart because they both max out at five. But what are we measuring with problems then? I, think, I agree. I think they're very rudimentary. I mean, I, I think they're good for gross differences, pre-op, post-op. Okay, you, if you measure problems, they're always going to be different, right? But to try and get the nuances between different approaches and, you know, um, that's where the functional tests. But often the functional tests are not different either. No, you do no. posterior approach, lateral, direct anterior, timed up and go, it's the same. You know, so it's even more nuanced than that. Or, there, or, or the answer is there's no real difference. Or, or we're not measuring the same thing. I think that the answer those... is no real difference. That... And the other thing that we know from uh, these psychometric analyses with patients is they vary over time. What is their, their, their yeah. outcome or their perceived recovery or goal will change from pre-op to post-op to a certain length of time post-op. And I don't know that we're, we're capturing that very well. So we've, we've made a difference. We're not going to always make people happy. We can't ignore that. Uh, basically, because a lot of outside agencies are looking at that and using patient reported outcomes naturally as a measure, but it is a moving target is my point. And uh, so it's going to change. Uh, what you said is a goal initially isn't going to be the goal a year after surgery. With that, I think it's a great way to end the, uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to take a second um, to welcome some visitors we have from the Japanese Hip Society on the fourth row. If you guys could just raise your hand real quick. They're visiting UCSF and they're with us. If any of you, uh, the traveling fellows heading to Los Angeles next week, uh, they have uh, amazing uh, insights into the way things are done in Japan. I encourage any of you and all of you to meet with them and ask them about their work and their research. It's really quite interesting. Um, let's do the operation that gives our patients the best function and the most durable outcomes. I think you stated at the beginning, Tad, and it was a really good way to start. I think we'll finish with that. Thank you.